Hello everybody, this is Jörg Lismann once again from YouTube channel Juggler66 and I will now continue doing the reading on the book, the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tupper Saucy, published in 1996. For continuation matters and better understanding, I will repeat the last paragraph of uh, chapter number 5 uh, that we read last time and then I will go on to the next chapter. But it is important to match these things together because this last paragraph rightly le leads us into the next uh, chapter of the reading. So, this is um, the last paragraph on page 47 in the uh, in the PDF of 24 in the page when you follow the reading. It was one thing to recommend learning against learning and quite another to manage its multiple dimensions. Learning against learning amounted to no less than making war on the Bible. To wage such a war, the papacy needed the, a new priestly order of pious soldiers conditioned to wield psychological weapons on a battlefield of human thought. But first, there had to be a general. The man chosen to lead the assault on the Bible was a swashbuckling adventurer from the proud Basque country of northern Spain. Now we come into chapter five, uh, 6 of Rulers of Evil, called Appointment at Cyprus. This general that was chosen, his name was Inigo de Loyola. He was born in 1491 to a rich family, youngest of eight boys, one of thirteen children. His older brother had sailed to the New World with Christopher Columbus. Isn't that an interesting fact to know? Inigo served as a page in the court of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. He became friends with Ferdinand's Belgian grandson, Charles Habsburg, whose other grandfather was the, was the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian. The Holy Roman Emperor was a kind of secular pope who presided over the Christian kingdoms of the Western world. Charles was propelled to great authority before his 21st birthday by the death of his two grandfathers within the space of two years. From Ferdinand, Charles inherited Spain. From Maximilian, he inherited the Holy Roman Empire. Charles Habsburg was King Charles I of Spain, Emperor Charles V of Rome. He was the most powerful secular figure in Europe, and he was Inigo's friend. In 1518, Inigo was part of a legation negotiating for Charles with Spain's traditional rival France at the court of Duke of Nariera in Valladolid. While the summit was in session, Katharina, the emperor's sister, was presented to the Nigeria court. Inigo fell in love with her. He was 27 and she was 11 years old. The emperor was 18 at that time. The match, however, was not to be. Grace on that. On Monday, May the 20th, 1521, while commanding a garrison at the Duke's fortress in Pamplona, Inigo was struck by a French cannonball. His right leg was shattered, and with it, since a well shaped leg was among a courtier's most prized assets, the prospects for a romantic life with Katharina or any other woman. An honor guard of the French soldiers before the wounded champ bore the wounded champion on a stretcher to his family's castle in the Spanish Pyrenees. Surgeons butchered his leg and reset the bones. He lost appetite and was told he might die. He made confessions and was given the last rites. But a few days after the feasts of Saints Peter and Paul, he was pronounced out of death's immediate grasp. He credited this recovery to his devotion to Saint Peter. Inigo remained bedridden for nearly a year. Under the concerned, if distant, eye of the youthful emperor, he spent his time, quote, searching for substitutes for the shattered ideals, ambitions and values that had been so central to his sense of himself, unquote. He gazed obsessively at a small icon of Saint Catherine, a gift from Queen Isabella, to his sister-in-law. The icon sparked dreams of Katharina, which only throttled his heart with desolation. He turned to books, Ludolf of Saxony's Life of Christ and Voragine's Lives of the Saints, 
the only two volumes in the family library despite the fact that a Spanish Bible had been available for 40 years. So, just uh, take a second here. What does this tell us? There's one lying on a sickbed. His dreams of being a courtier and womanizer have been shattered by a French cannonball. And then he seeks rescue, or not rescue, but, but uh, assurance in books. And those books are Ludolf of Saxony's Life of Christ and Voragine's Lives of the Saints, instead of reading the Bible that had been available there for 40 years. Isn't that interesting that people always turn another way instead to the Word of God? Continue. The icon and the books gave him visions. The visions, in turn, led him to develop a process of, quote, preparing and disposing the soul to rid itself of all inordinate attachments and, after their removal, of seeking and finding the will of God, unquote. Inigo called this process the spiritual exercises. Well, that is a word that maybe does not come uh, along very often again in this book, but the spiritual exercises is something that we have been talking extensively about on other broadcasts of my YouTube channel. You can check that out. On Nothing But The Truth and on Hour Of The Truth, we always go into spiritual exercises and how these spiritual exercises have today the whole world in their grip, because all the stuff coming out from Hollywood and from the news media is nothing else than spiritual exercises. But here you know how they were so-called invented. Continue reading. In the exercises, a director leads a retreatant through four weeks of intense prayer, meditation and dialogue with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Jesus and God the Father. Frequent repetition of Anima Christi, Loyola's own habitual prayer for disorientation and sensory depreviation. Blood of Christ, elaborate me, is advised. The first week is spent considering and contemplating sins, creating vivid mental pictures of, quote, hell in all its depth and breadth, putting, for, putting your five senses at the service of your imagination, unquote. The second week explores the life of Christ up to Palm Sunday inclusively. The third week undertakes the crucifixion, in which the retreatant is directed to, quote, imagine Christ our Lord present before you on the cross and begin to speak with him, and ask, what have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? What ought I to do for Christ? Unquote. The fourth week is occupied with the resurrection and ascension, after which the retreatant prays, Quote, for a knowledge of the deceits of the rebel chief and help to guard myself against them, and also to ask for a knowledge of the true life exemplified in the sovereign and true commander and the grace to imitate him. Unquote. By the time the exercises have run their course, the retreatant's purified imagination is totally dom dominated by mental pictures of Jesus resurrected, Jesus the King Militant. One can now answer the King's call to conquer Protestantism and its rebel chief, the enemy of human nature, with the selfless fidelity of a chivalrous knight. One's consciousness has been altered. One's soul and brain have been washed. One's liberty has been sacrificed to authority. One's individuality has been surrendered to the Christ of Rome. One no longer has a will of one's own. One volunteers for any assigned task, no matter how adverse. Well, I'm just going to stop here a second. When you read this and then you read the oath, the fourth oath of induction, the Jesuits have to pledge as allegiance, so-called, to the Pope. You know, we started that. <coughs> um, we started that one broadcast on nothing but the truth and examining the fourth oath of induction for two hours. Then you see all this coming back 
being like a cadaver. Uh, that's one said here. Once individuality, individuality has been surrendered to the Christ of Rome. Very important part because it's the Christ of Rome. It's not the Christ of the Bible. And that is what people who are in the Roman Catholic Church do not understand. They preach another Jesus. They preach another Christ. The same one they fear his they they uh, they have the feast on his birthday on the twenty fifth of December, which is not the birthday of Jesus Christ of the Bible, but the birthday of among others Tammuz from Babylon. So think about that when you read or listen to this little paragraph. I'm just going to read it once again. Once consciousness has been altered, once soul and brain have been washed. Once liberty has been sacrificed to authority, once individuality has been surrendered to the Christ of Rome, one no longer has a will of one's own. One volunteers for any assigned task, no matter how adverse. And this absolutely reflects everything that is in the fourth vow of induction. Now you can see where he got that from. By brainwashing himself. Martin Luther spent Loyola's years of recovery imprisoned at Wartburg Castle for insulting the papacy with his 95 Theses. Remarkably, while one of the prisoners uh, experienced mystical visions that urged him to defend the Church's honor in the romantically chivalrous manner of the Knights Templar, the other was translating with the miraculous permission of his keepers, the New Testament into German, so that ordinary people might learn the will of God directly. These parallel, simultaneous quests for holiness would define modern life's underlying conflict. Which master do I serve? Rome or the word of God? Well, this is deep, people. This is the question that we have to ask ourselves also. We cannot serve two masters. Which master do I serve? Rome or the word of God? Man or God? Do I listen to Min's teachings or do I listen to the God's teaching by reading and studying and understanding the Bible? Purified by the spiritual exercises Anigo's sensual attachment to Princess Katharina was transformed through Saint Catherine into a higher spiritual attachment to a higher femininity, to Mary, the Queen of Heaven. An apparition of the Virgin appeared to him one night and validated that he was free of fleshly lusts and was now worthy of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. In Martin Luther's opinion, as far as God is concerned, Jerusalem and all the Holy Land are not one whit more or less interesting than the cows in Switzerland. Now this is a very profound quote. And Martin Luther plays absolutely the same fiddle that I play. Jerusalem and all the Holy Land are not one whit more or less interesting than the cows in Switzerland. Why is that today a modern state of Israel? I don't want to deflect too far away from this book right now, but tell you that Martin Luther, at least at that point, had a perfect understanding of Daniel's prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he knew that the he in verse 27 was Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible, and not like a few years later from here on uh, beginning, the futurist teaching of an Antichrist to come. So there was no need for a holy city Jerusalem anymore. There was no need for a country of Israel. And this is why Martin Luther said, quote, As far as God is concerned, Jerusalem and all the Holy Land are not one whit more or less interesting than the cows in Switzerland. Unquote. This should really set one to thinking about what we are doing today with this country in Israel over there. This is all 
Hegelian dialectic. This is all in the agenda of the Antichrist who pushes that we are living now in the 69 weeks and living up to an unfulfilled 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, which Jesus Christ completely fulfilled 2,000 years ago. But I continue reading now. But to a spiritual warrior preparing to lead the church to war against scripture, a touchdown in Jerusalem was absolutely necessary. Jerusalem was the domain of King Solomon's temple, the geospiritual center of the Knights Templar. If an ego was to receive, uh, revive the Templars, <coughs> as the Emperor desired, it was liturgical, liturgically imperative that his newly washed spirit present itself in the sacred city for initiation into the mysteries of holy warfare. What do mysteries of holy warfare have to do with the Jesus Christ of the Bible, I ask you? All pilgrims to the Holy Land were required by law to apply to the Pope at Easter for permission to proceed. In early March 1522, more than a year in advance, Inigo set out for Rome in all his aristocratic finery, riding on the back of a mule. Huh. Riding on the back of a mule. Going to Rome and eventually to Jerusalem. Where did Jesus sit when he went into Jerusalem? On the back of a mule, right? The corrupt Leo X had died suddenly of malaria in December 1521. And on January 9, 1522, Charles Habsburg, the king and the emperor, had engineered the nearly anonymous election of his former tutor, Adrian Didel, to succeed Leo as Adrian VI. So, the Pope position, right? Enigo headed for Rome coincidentally with Adrian's journey across Spain to Barcelona, the point of embarkation for voyages to Italy. The new Pope stopped in Navarre, in northern Spain, for an official reception by the Duke of Najera's successor. Inigo, too, stopped at Navarre to do some undescribed business at the Duke's residence at Navarrete. Perhaps Adrian gave him a discreet audience. This is not for sure known. Further on, the pilgrim kept an all-night vigil at the chapel of Virgin of Aranzazu, protectress of the Basques, vowing his chastity to her small, dark statue. He continued on to Montserrat, where he lodged in a Benedictine abbey. There he rededicated himself to God's service before another statue of the Virgin, the Black Madonna of Montserrat, protectress of Catalonia, patroness of Christian conquest. The spiritual exercise here must have been intense, for in the late afternoon of a third day, Inigo traded clothes with a beggar, hung his sword and dagger on the Madonna's shrine, and gave his mule to the abbey. While Adrian VI proceeded to Barcelona, Inigo detoured on foot to the village of Manresa for ten months of penance, spiritual preparation and note-taking. Stripped of everything but sackcloth, a gourd for drinking and a pilgrim staff, he adopted the lifestyle of the early Knights Templars, begging food and alms. He was initiated into the Illuminati, the Enlightened Ones, a secret society of Gnostic fundamentalists who preached that all matter is absolutely and eternally evil. The Gnostics taught that humanity itself is of satanic origin. Adam and Eve were the offspring of devils. Humanity can achieve salvation from death and eternal punishment, however, by freeing soul from body for absorption for absorption uh, into the pure light of godliness. And who is the light bearer for the Gnostics? This is done by withdrawing from sensual pleasure and intuitively discovering hidden truths as conveyed by the Kabbalah that has its origins in Babylon. The Gnostics' contempt for anything having to do with the physical side of existence Related into, uh, translated into wildly ironic behavior. Some practiced radical celibacy because they believed the result of sexual intercourse, conception, 
would only imprison more souls and physical bodies. Others practiced unbridled sexual libertinism in order to prove they were completely free from all physical inhibition. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> free love to prove that you're free of the lusts of it. Still others combined the two, pursuing hypocritical lives of celibate fornication, of which safe sex is the modern institution. Loyola's particular cult apparently chose the asceticism of self-flagellation, for Inigo wandered many nights about the, Mancia, uh, the Manresa countryside, whipping himself with a scourge studded with iron barbs. Later in life he would decide that the whips and barbs, quote, sapped one's strength, unquote, that the Godhead could as adequately be sought by the more humane self-mortification of the spiritual exercises. While Inigo was outlining the exercises in Manresa, Luther's translation of the New Testament was introducing readers and listeners in Germany, Switzerland, France, Bohemia and England to a different form of spiritual exercises, one in which God's will, ancient and immutable, was expressed not within the private imagination but publicly, in the printed word, for all to see. People devoured the New Testament even before it reached the, bi the bindery. In one contemporary's words, quote, The sheet, yet wet, was brought from the press under someone's cloak and passed from shop to shop. Unquote. The pilgrim sailed from Barcelona to the Italian port city of Gaeta and walked the remaining distance to Rome, arriving there on Palm Sunday, March 29, 1523. Two days later, according to Vatican archives, quote, Inigo de Loyola, cleric of the Diocese of Pamplona, unquote, received permission from Pope Adrian VI to visit Jerusalem. From Rome, Inigo proceeded to Venice, where one of Charles Habsburg's agents received him graciously and introduced him to, to the dog, uh, the dog, Andrea Gritti the highest official in Venetian civil government. A famed diplomat and linguist, Gritti arranged free passage for Enigio aboard a small ship whose name, the Negrona, was appropriate for an evangelist dedicated to the Black Virgin of Christian conquest. Negrona. Yeah, Black Virgin. On July 14th, 1523, the Negrona left Venice arriving a month later at the island of Cyprus. At Cyprus, one Diego Manes and his servant, along with several Cypriot officials, boarded ship for the rest of the voyage to Haifa. Diego Manes was a commander of the Knights Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem. Since 1312, the Hospitallers had held the title to vast wealth of the Knights Templar. They had been drawing upon these assets to defend the Roman economy against Islamic marauders in the east. But when the Turks attacked the Hospitallers' headquarters on the island of Rhodes, the assets were frozen by the people and his former pupil, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles. No assistance in any form was forthcoming from either party. Consequently, in December 1522, the Hospitallers had no choice but to surrender Rhodes and retreat to what would become their final domicile, Malta. The message was clear. Now that Luther's German language New Testament was in print, Protestantism loomed a greater menace to Rome than Islam ever did. And very interesting is here that they would, that they would come after Rhodes to their final domicile, Malta. Now learn about the Sovereign Military Order of Malta. And they are all over. They are everywhere. That's why knowing the Knights of Malta today is absolutely necessary to understand all this. We will go much more into this book and probably have much more to do with the Knights of Malta. But I made a video 
uh, on my channel Nothing But The Truth, The Power of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta and I would like you to check that one out and then you have a little of understanding what they are today standing for. Continue reading. It is possible that in a Jerusalem-bound ship named Negrona, Commander Diego Manes turned over the litanies, lists, secret codes, formula, Kabbalah and other portable assets comprising the Knights Templar resource to Inigo. If this indeed happened, the Western world's secret infrastructure was now Loyola's to populate and manipulate in the course of learning against learning. That is my hypothesis. What is not hypothesis is that as soon as the pilgrim returned from Jerusalem, he began vesting himself with Medici learning. The idea of uniting the Templars with the Hospitallers was first argued publicly in a book published in 1305 by Raymond Lowe, a renowned Illuminatus from Mallorca. Lowe's book, Libre de Fin, or Free at Last, appeared in the midst of a raging controversy between the French monarchy and the Roman papacy over who held jurisdiction over the Templars. That will be the subject of our next chapter. But before I continue reading I will just go back to the last paragraph that I read because I think this is very interesting to understand. The idea of uniting the Templars with the Hospitallers was first argued publicly in a book published in 1305 by Raymond Lowe, a renowned Illuminatus from Mallorca. Lull's book, Libre de Fin, or uh, Free at Last, appeared in the midst of a raging controversy between the French monarchy and the Roman papacy over who held jurisdiction over the Templars. That will be the subject of our next chapter. 1305. And what happened on the 13th of October in 1307? The Templars got arrested all over France. Two years later, after Lull spoke in his book of uniting the Hospitallers with the Templars. Isn't that interesting history? Who had taught you that in school? I have never heard of that before. But I think it's something very interesting to go more deeply in. And as he says, this is the subject of our next chapter. And the next chapter is called The Epitome of Christian Values. Since their founding on French soil in 1118, the Knights Templars had grown from a pair of self-impoverished knights hoping to keep Muslim terrorists from molesting pilgrims in the Holy Land to a mammoth organization controlling international finance and politics. The founders, Hugh de Payen and Godefroy de Saint-Omer, organized a group of excommunicated knight crusaders and secured their absolution by a bishop. After placing the restored knights under oaths of poverty, chastity, chastity, secrecy and obedience, they pledged the organization to rebuilding Salomon's temple. Given space adjacent to an Islamic mosque sitten, situated upon the temple's supposed ruins, they took the corporate name Poor Knights of Christ and of the Temple of Salomon. Bernard, abbot of Clairvaux, the leading propagandist of the day, extolled the Templars as quote, the epitome and apotheosis of Christian values. Unquote. Bolstered by such unprecedented promotion, the poor knights attracted the best and brightest young men of Europe to become crusaders, to vow celibacy and leave their families in defense of Christ's tomb against Muslim terrorists. The mission failed within nine years. Even so, Bernard's propaganda caused the Templars to be, revived, uh, to be received as conquering heroes when they returned to France. They set up their permanent lodge at Troyes under the patronage of the court of Champagne. For nearly a century Troyes had been Europe's leading school for the study of the Kabbalah, which may explain why the city is laid out in the shape of a champagne cork. So I'm going to stop here. When you read the book, you will see a little uh, design that was made of the city of Troyes there in France. 
laying in the in the in the uh, in the region of Champagne. But the problem is, Champagne wasn't invented until the 18th century, and we are talking here about some few hundred years before that. So I would rather say this must be some kind of uh, even I don't like that word coincidence, or anybody has seen in the future and seen that because normally those corks weren't available at that time. At least I think so. But anything, of course, uh, anyway, of course, I think it's funny that uh, for nearly a century when Troy had been uh, Europe's leading school for the study of the Kabbalah, which may explain why the city is laid out in the shape of a champagne cork, at least it is uh, a, f a funny incident. Coincident? I don't know. But, you know, it was hundreds of years before that, so. For making the Templars a world power, Bernard shares credit with Cardinal Eimerick of Santa Maria Nuova. Eimerick was the church's highest judicial officer. It was his unlawful connivance that created Honorius II, the Pope who ordained the Templars as the church's most highly esteemed religious order. It was Eimerick, too, who devised a radical, quote, inner renewal of the church, unquote which inspired noblemen throughout England, Scotland, Flanders, Spain and Portugal to shower the Templars with donations of land and money, over and above the properties required of all initiates upon joining the order. Sounds a little bit like, um, what what is that called there, that, uh, that religion that um, Tom Cruise is in there? Sounds like Scientology, doesn't it? They also take everything away that you have, right? There's nothing new under the sun, people. It's always history repeating itself. Okay, you know, when Honorius died in 1130, Americ led a minority of cardinals in another connivance, resulting in the election of Innocent II, who was consecrated Pope in Americ's titular church of Santa Maria Nuova. In 1139, Innocent issued a bull, placing the Templars under an exclusive vow of papal obedience, a measure by which Americ effectively put all Templar resources at the disposal of the papacy. Within another decade, the knights were given exclusive rights by Pope Eugenius III to wear the Rose Croix, the Rosy Cross, on their white tunics. As their list of properties lengthened with donations from Italy, Austria, Germany, Hungary and the Holy Land, the Templars built hundreds of great stone castles. You can see them all over Europe still today. Wealthy travelers lodged in these castles because of their unmatched security. Convinced that they were building a new world, the Templars called each other Frère Masson, Brother Mason. Later, this term would be anglicized into Freemason. The Templars invented modern banking by applying an oriental invention to their commerce. Agents of the Chinese emperor Cao Tsung, inventor of the paper currency called Fai Qian or flying money, sought trade with the Middle East during the period of Templar occupation. Cao Tsung was the first government Tsangs uh, was the first government on earth to enforce circulation of drafts as legal tender for debts. Evidently, Kao Tsang's agent introduced the knights to this new medium of exchange created out of merchant drafts. The Templars enhanced their already booming business of accepting current accounts, deposit accounts, deposits of jewels, valuables and titles and deeds, making loans and advances, charging fees because the church forbade interest, and acting as agents for the secure transmission of such things by adding circulating letters of credit, flying money, to serve as paper currency. To supply the Templars' currency needs, uh, needs may explain why paper in France was first manufactured in the poor knight's hometown of Troyes. You know, the champagne-shaped city over there in uh, the champagne cork city-shaped uh, over there in uh, Champagne, in the northern of France. 
By 1300, presiding over the world economy from their Paris office, the Templars had become an international power unto themselves. Engaged in diplomacy at the highest levels of state from the Holy Land westward, they set the tastes, the goals, the morality, the rules of the civilized world. Kings did their bidding. When Henry III of England threatened to confiscate certain of the order's properties, he was upbraided by the Master Templar in the city of London. Quote, what sayest thou, king? So long as thou dost exercise justice, thou wilt reign. But if thou infringe it, thou wilt cease to be king. Unquote. But suddenly, at their very zenith, the poor knights suffered a strange reversal of fortunes. In 1302, King Philip IV of France dared to challenge their sovereignty on his own soil. He asserted that in France everyone, Knights Templars included, was subject to the king. Pope Boniface VIII jumped in and declared that France, the king, the Templars, all of them, and everybody else as well, belonged to Pontifex Maximus. Quote, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to to the Roman pontiff." Unquote. Philip then accused the Pope of illegitimacy, sexual misconduct and heresy. Bonifaci prepared a bull excommunicating Philip, but before it could be published a band of Philip's mercenaries stormed the Vatican and demanded the Pope's resignation. Although the intruders were driven off, the shock to body and soul was too much for Bonifaci and he died a month later. Two successor popes held firm against Philip, until Bertrand de Gaulle, Archbishop of Bordeaux, was elected in 1305. Crowned in Lyon with the papal name Clement V, de Gaulle moved the papacy to Avignon and began a long train of concessions to Philip's royal prerogative. Finally, on Friday, October 13, 1307, Philip arrested all but 13 of the Templars in France, tried them and, upon evidence of their practice of the Kabbalah, found them guilty of blasphemy and magic. At least 50 knights were burned at the stake. From captured documents it was learned that the Templars from the very beginning had renounced what Roman theolo theologians called quote, the religion of St. Peter. Unquote. They had been initiated into a secret Gnostic branch of the Eastern Church known as the Primitive Christian Church. Because the Primitive Christians apostolic succession claimed to flow from John the Baptist and the Apostle John, they were called Johannites. Uh, Johannites. The Johannites believed that although Jesus was imbued with the Spirit wholly divine, and endowed with the most astounding qualities, unquote, he was not the true God. Consistent with Gnostic logic, the true Johannite God would never lower himself to become vile human matter. Jesus was in fact a false messiah, sent by the powers of darkness. He was justly crucified, although when his sight was pierced, he did repent of his pretensions and receive divine forgiveness. Thanks to his repentance, Jesus now enjoys everlasting life in the celestial company of the saints. Oh, how twisted is that? Regarding miracles, the Johannites believe that Jesus, quote, did or may have done extraordinary or miraculous things, unquote, and that, quote, since God can do things incomprehensible to human intelligence, all the acts of Christ, as they are described in the Gospel, whether acts of human science, whether acts of divine power, unquote, can be accepted as true, except for the resurrection, which is omitted from the Templar's copy of the Gospel of St. John. Therefore, for all his wonderful attributes, Christ, quote, was nothing a false prophet and of no value." Unquote. 
only the higher God of heaven had power to save mankind. But the higher God avoided human matter, and so lordship over the material world belonged to Sataniel, the evil brother of Jesus. Sataniel alone could enrich mankind. Templar Kabbalah represented Sataniel as the head of the goat emblazoned with, sometimes contained within, a pentagram. This symbol is deeply rooted in Old Testament Kabbalah, in which the goat is identified with power in the world and separation from God. On the greatest Israelite fast day, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, one goat was spared the sacrificial knife and was sprinkled with the blood of another goat killed for the sins of Israel. The spared goat, the scapegoat, was then banished from the congregation to bear Israel's sins into the wilderness, which typified the world. The scapegoat escaped with his life and his freedom. You know, I will stop reading right here because this was really heavy and I think uh, when you follow the reading in the PDF or in the book itself, you should really take uh, another few minutes to read all that again about the way that they teach the Jesus of the Bible, the brother of Satan. I mean, uh, this is even for me for the moment too, too, too much for words, but uh, this is all documented that they had these belief systems. So, I will stop the reading right here and will continue next time in the middle of chapter 6. Uh, we still have some uh, two pages to go on this chapter before the next chapter, but I think I left you with something to reflect on after this reading today. Uh, I think it was quite intense to understand how this general of this new to make organization had to come about. And there you see it was all planned. It was not only Inigio who planned that, and, and he was initiated into the Illuminati or Las Alambrados, as you can call them there from Spain. It was all planned long ago. And did you see, or did you read, did you understand? the implications that his family had, the connections his family had with even the Emperor of Europe, of the Holy Roman Empire at that time. There is nothing happening in the world of politics that is coincidence, and it is no coincidence that the person with those connections was chosen the way that he made, and that he could do his spiritual exercises, and from out his spiritual exercises go with his society to betray the whole world in the name of the God of this world, which according to the Bible is Satan. Yeah, so I found it a very interesting reading. I hope uh, you could stay awake <laughs> and follow or learn something and enjoy it yourself. The more I read this, the more I enjoy it, I have to tell you, and I'm looking forward to doing the next part, but uh, for the moment I'm going to leave it. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching the video. Until the next time, don't forget to do your own research. God bless you and bye-bye.